This is Larry Williams back on StockCharts.com and I'm really excited today what I have to share with you, indicators. You know, usually we swear at our indicators, we don't swear by our indicators. I'm gonna show you why in this presentation. I'm gonna bring up the indicators that are the best that I found in my almost 60 years of trading. Technical ones, fundamental ones, show you their limitations, why they have them, and the best way of using them. So let's get started. Swear by them or swear at them, well, Market indicators, usually people swear by them, but those are the people that created them. And here's the problem, whether it's myself or anybody that's created these indicators, we all fall in love with our own stuff. Who are the best kids on the block? My kids, right? So when you read the books and people have all the various indicators in there, they develop, so they have, a, an unbiased, they have a very biased view about how good the indicator is. So I really don't wanna take what anybody says about their indicator. Uh, take it with a grain of salt until you've really checked, put it on your charts and looked at it and figure out why the indicator should work. That's really important because people that develop these indicators have a very distinct indicator bias. Well, either indicators don't work or we don't know how to use them. And I think it's a little bit of each. There are clearly some indicators that I have found uh, that I've created myself that really don't work. You don't hammer with a saw is the bottom line here. You need to know what your indicator can do and what it cannot do. So why do we even have indicators? Really, I think we do because they let us see what we naturally can't see. If you look at a chart, you can't really see if it's overbought or oversold. Oh, sure, in a strong uptrending market, you know that it's in an uptrend, but in a sideway to choppy market, is it a really in an uptrend or what's it doing? You really don't know. So through applying mathematical principles to price action, we can get a better idea of what's going on. And of course, then we have fundamentals and fundamentals are stuff that we don't usually see on our charts. So I wanna show you a lot of charts with fundamentals. Oh my gosh, they're so really helpful. Now they're not timing trades for us, but they give us the setup for the trades. Uh, also, a lot of indicators can help us see the cycles in the market. My view, most people's view. Our markets are cyclical. They go up and they go down. They tend to dance to a similar tune most of the time. Another indicator that I like to use is indicators that would reflect smart money buying. Clearly, there's a lot of different players in the marketplace. Some are very astute, very smart. Some aren't. Some lose a lot of money doing this. So if we can break out the winners from the losers and follow their buying and selling in the marketplace, in theory, we should do a heck of a lot better. And some indicators help us see extreme action. Uh, that's probably a better way of identifying bottoms in the marketplace because bottoms are so extreme. Top things kind of roll over, but when we see extreme action, a huge amount of buying or selling and put call ratios or whatever the indicators are, it alerts us to an anomaly in the market, uh, an aberration in the market. And those usually are significant turning points in price. So, some indicators work, some hardly ever work, and that's why we need to know their limitations. One thing I notice when people have their charts on, they have so many indicators and they're wondering, there's a big question, what's the one indicator that's gonna work? Um, whenever I speak in public, the two questions I get are, what's the best indicator and what market to trade? And my answer, what market to trade is whatever market's ready to trade now, which market's set up. And in terms of what's the best indicator, Oh, guys and gals, I wish there was one because I would follow it, but I haven't found it. I don't think there is one be-all, end-all indicator. What's more important to me is what is the purpose of the indicator? Each indicator needs to have a different purpose. And how can you look at these indicators? How can you tell the good ones from the ones that aren't so good? Probably shelf, shelf life. The longer these indicators have been around, the better they probably are. And not necessarily, of course, because somebody may come up with a cat's pajamas tomorrow. That's fine, let's look at it. Let's go back in time and check it out. But for the most part, the indicators that you see in your charts, uh, my percent are Jerry Appel, a great friend of mine's MACD, uh, Stochastic, Bollinger Band, those have been around a long time, which means they've stood the test of time. So that suggests to us that those are probably the better indicators. But who are you gonna call, right? It's like the old Ghostbusters saying, which indicator are you gonna get? Well, first I'm gonna look at fundamental indicators because fundamental indicators 
I was a look at things that cause things to happen. Most technical stuff that you see in your charts when you pull up stockcharts.com are technical in their derivation. And all they are is a reflection of price, uh, a manipulation of price data in one way or another, massaging price data, but fundamentals are totally different. And stockchart.com has some really good fundamental stuff. They show the yield curve. Oh my gosh, is this a good indicator? Now here you can see at the peak in 2007, look at the yield curve it was flat and coming down, indicating probably gonna have some tough sledding ahead in the marketplace. Notice we see the same thing, the yield curve going down at the start of the 2002 bear market. Same thing, that where that yield curve is, is telling us what investors think will happen in the future. If interest rates in the future are higher or lower than now, it's a strong message to the market. So that's a great fundamental tool to tell us where we are. So where are we now is what you're probably wondering. And here we are. You can see the stockcharts.com. Uh, we've seen the big decline in the marketplace. When we look at the yield curve, it's not flat or down. It's actually still up. And that's bullish. Remember, when it's down like that, that's bearish. When it's up like this, that's a bullish contention for the marketplace. The best fundamental indicators that I found are at the Federal Reserve. They have great, great information on employment, GDP growth, inflation. They actually have indicators that will tell you when a recession is starting, when a recession is ending. And recently, they have market sentiment. If you're looking for a really good market sentiment tool, there's probably no better place to go than the Federal Reserve. I'm going to show you. And all these indicators, of course, are free. We're looking now at the employment uh, data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis. This is a longer term chart. You can see that when employment starts to turn up, we usually enter recessions. And we've just had to turn up employment. And also these gray lines are when the employment, when the recession starts and when the recession ends. Notice that when unemployment starts to come down uh, and people are getting back to work, recessions are over. So it's a good conceptual idea to look at employment and recessions. And here's a blow up of where we are now. You can see due to the coronavirus, a huge increase in unemployment, but has now started to come down. That's really good news. And you can follow all this, of course, for free at the Federal Reserve uh, Bank of St. Louis. Uh, these charts are updated every single week. And actually this was done earlier in the week that we've come down one more time period in here. So we're not seeing as much unemployment as we did a month ago. It's a really interesting way that the Fed takes all this data and manipulates it. This is one of the really neat ones. The orange line that you see here, people switching, switching jobs, going from job to job because they can go to another job and get more money, go to another job and kind of work up the ladder, right? As long as that orange line is going up, the economy is good. But as soon as the economy noticed the recession here and the recession over here, job people stop switching jobs. And they're really good at knowing in advance when to stop switching jobs. Look at that, 2008, before the recession began, they stopped switching jobs. Uh, we've just started to turn down a little bit here. When people are switching jobs, they're gradually getting into other jobs. That's a bullish sign. When they're not switching jobs, they're coming down, they're staying at the same jobs. That's a great sign of a recession. We can also look at GDP growth. The Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta issues GDP forecasts. They've been really good, by the way. You can see what they're saying right now, that the uh, GDP is, we're going to go into negative GDP. Uh, the Atlanta Fed estimates were going to be about negative 35. And this is a trend. Now, here's the interesting thing, though. How bad is GDP growth of the stock market? Do you have any idea? Well, here's the correlation study done by the Federal Reserve. And they basically said, we don't see any relationship between stock prices and GDP. The Dow Jones is the blue line that you see, and the red line is uh, annual, uh, annualized rate of change of GDP. And their economists who are a lot smarter and better trained than I am, or ever will be, as basically said, we don't see any relationship. And that's a really interesting point because people think the market is the economy. It is and it isn't. It may not be the economy. The economy may be really good and um, stocks can go down 
or the economy may be bad, but stocks bottom because stocks usually bottom before the market makes a low. In fact, in the study I did going back to 1900, every single time the market's bottom prior to the economy getting good. The Fed also does a great job of predicting inflation. This is year ahead inflation expectations. So we can see what they're expecting right now is a downward trend in inflation. They're expecting deflation, not inflation. Well, that's really helpful if you're in the gold market, the bond market and real estate to know what inflation is going to do. Well, how do you find out? You don't, I don't know. The Federal Reserve is going to tell me. Some people are just clueless. They want to end the Fed. No, please don't do that. They have this plethora of really good market indicators that we can use to help us understand the fundamentals. So don't end the Fed, or at least make certain they're still giving us those indicators. Now, look at this from the Federal Reserve. This is really interesting. Inflation is a five-year forward inflation expectation. That's what they're expecting inflation and it's caused by crude oil prices. Look at the correlation between crude oil prices and inflation. A lot of people think that gold is a harbinger or a leading indicator of inflation, but look at this. From 2006 forward, last 14, 15 years, inflation has been determined by crude oil prices. So if you're worried about inflation, what's crude oil doing? There is the answer for you. Isn't that nice to be able to have that? And you can look at this and you can look at all the Fed data. You can manipulate, you can see this little box over here. You can slide these back and forth to get a different picture, a different time period. But wow, isn't that nice to know what the expectation is of inflation and the driving force behind it. They do have recession indicators, uh, which tells when we go into recession. As you can see, they are currently saying we are in a recession. Now the line has come down a little bit. We may get out of the recession, but a lot of people pay thousands of dollars a year for recession indicator services. You got it at the Fed for free. This is their indicator going all the way back now to 1960. It's done a pretty good job of calling recessions prior to the recession taking place. And they have market sentiment. This is a newer tool they've just released and it's done a great job of calling the lows. Now remember, markets tend to bottom before the recession is over. Uh, look what happened in 1990. We were extremely negative. The sentiment was very negative and the market bottomed. Uh, 1998 bottom, the 2000 bottom, the 2008 bottom, 2011. And just recently prices again went below or into that really negative pessimistic area where there's so many people so bearish that we better be bullish. So if you're looking for a really long-term sentiment indicator, there it is, going all the way back to 1980, again, courtesy of the Federal Reserve System. Another great place for fundamental data is Ed Yardini. Uh, at Yardini.com has a lot of great information. This is a stock valuation model the Federal Reserve uses where they look at the fair value price of the S&P that's in red versus the actual uh, index. And you can get some pretty good ideas of when, when the blue line, if you will, stock prices are overvalued, uh, stocks come down. When we're way undervalued, stocks rally. Currently we're undervalued. That's the Federal Reserve model of stock prices. So uh, that's a great treasure trove as well if you're looking for fundamental data. Well, we've got the fundamental data behind this, probably data you haven't been aware of before. What most people have are technical stuff, all the indicators on their charts. There are really two types of technical indicators. One that I think really are just telling us where we've been and one that suggests where we might be going. I've always had a thought in my mind that most chart indicators are like waves on a boat. They show where the boat's been. You can look at the waves or the smokestack on a boat and see the smoke coming out of the boat. It tells us which way the boat's gone but as it doesn't tell us where it's going because that boat can turn on a dime in an instant. If we knew who the captain was, we followed the captain, then we could tell when the boat's gonna move. Pretty much the same way with the markets. A lot of indicators just say where they've been. I want indicators that suggest where we might be going. So why we swear at indicators, it's not all the indicators fault. Most of them are so doggone redundant. People don't get this. This is the biggest error that I see when I look at people's charts. 
I can't believe the number of indicators they have on them. And they're all the same. They have my percent R, they have stochastics. It looks just like Bollinger percent B, which looks just about like RSI. All those overbought, oversold indicators are redone. You have one as you need, that's all you need. You don't have four or five, they're all the same. Oh, sure, there might be an ounce of spit difference between them, but really not very much. The thing with indicators is most people have too many indicators on their charts to begin with. So they get lost paralysis by analysis, if you will. But they forget each indicator must serve a separate purpose. So when you look at my charts, you're going to see I have indicators and each serves a separate purpose. One is going to show me trend, overbought, oversold. One's going to show if momentum is accelerating or de-accelerating right now. I want to look at accumulation. Who's buying? Smart money or dumb money? I want to know what happens usually at this time of the year. That would be seasonal indicator. And there are certain little patterns in the market that people have written about for many years, triangles, wedges, whatever. Well, those, those patterns, some are pretty good, especially say if you had a bullish pattern when there's been bullish accumulation in the marketplace. And then cycles, a natural ebb and flow of how markets move. Each market has a little different cycle or pattern to it. So I can have an indicator that measures each one of those. So if I was measuring overbought, oversold, I only need one. I could use percent R, stochastics, uh, um, RSI, Bollinger B, uh, channel index, a, a plethora of them out there. There are almost as many indicators as traders. And we don't need all of them. Just remember, each indicator must serve a separate purpose. You might want to write these things down. These are the purposes for my indicators. You may come up with other things an indicator could do beyond my little list of six things. You're like, well, what do I want my indicator to do here? And then look and find an indicator that does that. Each indicator must serve a specific purpose. If it doesn't, throw it out. Stop swearing at your indicator. Use them correctly. Well, let's look at some examples. This is trend anti-trend. There are really only two ways to make money in the market. You're going to ride a big trend or you're going to sell the highs and buy the lows, anti-trend, and you can combine them. The little dash line you see in the chart is a 50-day moving average. So we'll clearly see the market's down, right? Even a kid can see that. Then you can use a short-term oscillator. Again, it doesn't have to be mine. It can be any of them. There's a lot of good ones on stockcharts.com. And when we're in a big downtrend and we're overbought, you probably look for some nice sell signals in the marketplace. This is what most people do wrong. The market's coming down and down. They want the market to bottom. So they're taking buy signals when the oscillators are in the buy area or oversold, negating the fact that you're in big and a downtrend. So really look at the potential buy here, 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 here. None of them were very good. Why? Not the indicator's fault. The fault is the chartist forgets, oh, wait. The big trend is down, so I want to take sells, not buys. It's not the indicator's fault. It's how we use that indicator. I also like to look at momentum. Jerry Appel developed a great indicator, been around forever, MACD. Oh my gosh, it's really good. And momentum leads price. Momentum leads the averages. Here's price, starts to come down, but momentum rolled over prior to price. And look at the low. We really didn't know when we're low here. The low and momentum comes here and we get a crossing of momentum over here and over here. And here momentum's petered out in the market while prices are still going higher. So momentum to me is like an x-ray view, an underpinning of the market. How is the market really moving? Is it starting to deteriorate? Momentum will tell us that. I also like to look at accumulation. Who's buying, who's selling? Well. Uh, on balance volume is just about everybody's chart books and chart services. Uh, Chartstocks.com has it, was developed by a couple of people, a husband and wife team in San Francisco uh, in the 1940s, popularized by my friend Joe Granville when he called it on balance volume. And it's a pretty good indicator to the test of time. I started using this in 1963 or four, something like that. Same rules then as now. If price rallies to a new high here, 
but accumulation can't get back to the old high. We're probably seeing selling in the marketplace. Notice we had a nice strong rally here. It looks really positive, but there's no buying. We're seeing lower highs in accumulation, higher highs in price, and the market falls apart. Then we start to see the opposite down here. Price is lower here than here. Accumulation is higher here than here. A lot of accumulation came in unleaded gasoline in this time frame, and then all of a sudden one day it pops to the upside. Why? Because accumulation was coming in the market. Look how steeply down price is here but we don't see that in accumulation. Now, there are a lot of ways of measuring accumulation. I also, for commodities, combine price, open interest, and volume all into one because open interest really matters in the future market. In the stock market, you wanna use unbalanced volume. Why? Because we don't have open interest in uh, stocks, just futures. So we can do the same thing here and you get the same basic message. Notice we're rallying in here, looks good but we're flat in accumulation. There's no a big up thrust on this big rally. There was no accumulation falling through. At the lows, we see lower prices in here, but not in accumulation. Open interest is changing in here. See the same thing over here. We're making lower lows in price, but accumulation, looking at volume, price, and open interest, they know people are buying this market and the market moves to the upside. So for futures, I really like to use uh, price, open interest, and volume. And you can look at a lot of other people create some good indicators. I'm just, you know, these are my kids. These are the ones I know the best. But open interest clearly can be helpful in the futures market. Here's another example. We're looking now at um, silver. And you can see what happens when the market starts to diverge and we get buying in the market. But another way of looking is an indicator that I use that uses professional accumulation. Here's the deal. Professionals don't buy like the public does. They tend to buy on weakness, not strength. The public tends to chase strength. So I've been able to develop this index. And the nice thing about it, it gives more, you don't get a lot of buy signals, sell signals in OPV or my price open interest volume. But in this, you got a lot more. You can see a great example of it here in silver. Silver breaks out to a new high. Oh my gosh, happy days are here again but professional accumulation didn't. In fact, it couldn't even make the old high negative and leads to the sell signal. We saw the same thing over here. Market looks strong, but not an accumulation. Here, the market's coming down steeply, but look at the big divergions. The, on this decline in price right here, the red line of accumulation by professionals didn't decline at all. In other words, professionals were buying the decline. They weren't panicking, they weren't selling. They were over here, they were selling the rally. Here they're actually buying the dip. So that's a really good way of also looking at what's going on in the marketplace. Here's the S&Ps, you can see what's been going on here. Big divergence, higher highs in price, but uh-oh, divergence between a professional accumulation. Just as at the low, look at that, lower, lower, lower but the professionals didn't sell this last decline. They were accumulating, see the diversions and see the rally. Well, I do like to look at the seasonal influence in the markets. I wrote the first book about this in commodities way back in 1973, and it's still true. Usually markets move about the same every year. Not always, but about, we can see right now, the, the seasonal pattern for the stock prices to come down. And recently stock prices have been getting weak. They should start to get strong around a uh, we bottom this year. Oh, and we also had the accumulation uh, divergence with professionals buying in the marketplace. So you can combine these tools using them together. So another example is a professional accumulation. We're looking at gold now. It looks like a really nice strong rally if we're looking at just price, but uh oh, look at that the professionals were getting out of the market. Down here, they're selling, the market looks weak, but actually professionals are buying. We start a huge rally. So that's a technique, a tool that helps me just see who's buying, who's selling. Another one I really like to use, of course, the commitment to trader report. Um, it's so good in the gold market as it is in most markets. The only market's really not very good in is S&Ps, E-mini stock indexes. Uh, there's so much hedging in that market, it really doesn't work very well there. But as you can see, when, when the commercials are at a high level, gold rallies, right? Doesn't call it to the day, but gold rallies. Well, I developed my theoretical index 
we call COTC, that matches the actual COT index. Notice my theoretical index is bullish here. So are commercials, bullish over here. Commercial work just about bullish market rallies. Same thing over here. So the nice thing about the, what we call COTC, here it is in crude oil. Notice that crude oil just follows pretty much, the lines move the same, don't they? Pretty much the same. That means we can use this not only on commodities where we don't get uh, up-to-date commitment of trader report, but we can also use it on stocks. Look at the Kotze index on the E-minis. This was telling us commercials are buying in here, here and here, and they are buying here. The actual COT index isn't as bad or isn't as good. It was actually suggesting commercials were selling here because they're hedging. But we can take this indicator and put it on individual stocks because people that professionally buy stocks probably about buying about like smart money buys commodities. Not a lot of difference. And this is Google. Look at when the professionals were buying Google when they were accumulating it. My Kotze index from futures also works really well in the stock market. How cool is that, huh? Here again, you can see it on Costco, the same idea. And chart patterns, there's so many chart patterns, there's wedges, triangles, head, shoulders. Trust them, but verify them. They don't all work. And I think they work better if you put them in conjunction with maybe a time you wanna buy when uh, there's been a lot of accumulation in the market, then a bullish chart pattern will work better, especially if you're in an uptrend. Cycles, the problem with cycles, they vary all over the place. The blue was the best cycle at the start of 2020. That was a cycle forecast, but right now the best is red because these cycles dance, they move back and forth, they go every place. So you really have to update cycles. It's a labor of love and an art. The cycles are like perfection. It's a moving target. You're never, never gonna get perfect in this business and cycles are, always moving all over the place. So putting it all together, fundamental indicators are really important. They give you a view of what's going to happen. Technical indicators help us to trade for trade confirmation and for timing. Remember, indicators are tools. They're not be all end all magic secrets. They're tools. Learn to use your tools. You gotta have the right tool for the right job. That's really critical. My father worked in an oil refinery. Late one winter night, he was called out about three in the morning. They went to the boiler and they had a problem with a heating element there. And the guy said, yeah, we can do this, Richard. We can fix it with this. And he said, no guys, we don't have the right tool for the right job. He always drilled that in my head. He got his work crew, they walked back to the tool shed to get the tools and the boiler blew up. It would have killed six people had they not gone to get the right tool for the right job in the Continental Oil Refinery in Billings, Montana. Great lesson to me from my dad, right tool for the right job. Well, I hope that's helped you give a, an impression of indicators, which indicators to use. We will be having our indicators in stockcharts.com pretty soon, look forward to that as well. I, I'm certain you'll get a notice about that. Or come trade with me with my Larry TV, we'll be doing that until the end of this year. Our website is ireallytrade.com. Hope it's been a good learning experience for you today. I've enjoyed it. I hope you have as well. Until next time, Larry Williams wishing you good luck. Hey guys, Grayson Rose here with StockCharts.com. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Remember, if you did, give us a like down below, leave us a comment, we'd love to hear from you. And most importantly, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel for daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial minds. We'll see you back here very soon. Happy charting, my friends.